Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, this is Rajesh Balan, faculty from School of Information Systems, Singapore Management University. I'm going to give the first in a series of lectures on mobile and pervasive technology and applications. What we're going to do today is we're going to try and demystify some of the definitions that surround this field. And we're going to talk in general about what's the opportunities in this field. Okay? So this is actually the overview of what we're going to cover today. We're going to do a bit of the definitions, then we're going to dig a little deeper, and what's actually most important is what you're going to take away from the module. Hopefully at the end of it, you'll have a better understanding of what these technological terms mean, and what you can actually do in the space to make a difference. So let's jump straight in with some definitions. Now, this field in particular has a lot of definitions, and they can be quite confusing to people who are not trained in this field. So hopefully by the what I'm trying to do is trying to demystify many of these definitions. Now, first and foremost, we have the term general computing. Now, this is a big word that lots of people use to just mean anything and everything to do with computers. If you have a computer and it does something, it is general computing. After that, people talk about secure computing, which is almost anything to do with making your computer secure. You know, passwords, authentication, cryptography, all those sort of things fall under this space. Then come to the more interesting things, the ones that we are going to talk about, mobile computing. Now, mobile computing generally refers to anything you do on the move. Now, it doesn't have to involve cell phones. The humans could be on the move, and that is still mobile computing. You know, you could place uh, displays in the environment and have humans move from display to display. That is still mobile computing. But by and large, today, mobile computing means that you have a cell phone and you're doing stuff on it while on the move. Then we have pervasive computing. Now, pervasive computing is a superset of almost everything else we have seen on this slide, including mobile computing, secure computing, and general computing. Pervasive computing just means computing that is everywhere, computing that interacts with you in your daily life. So, for example, if you have a display terminal that you interact with, that is pervasive computing. If you have a laptop that you use, that is pervasive computing. If you use Wi-Fi, that is pervasive computing. It is things that come into your life on a daily basis. And the final definition we have is ubiquitous computing. Now, these two terms, pervasive and ubiquitous computing, can be confusing to people. But don't worry. They are exactly the same thing. <laughs> they, are, they mean the same thing, just with two different names. If you look up the definition of ubiquitous in a dictionary, it will say pervasive and vice versa. Okay, So ubiquitous and pervasive computing is computing that you can use anywhere. And this is actually what we are aiming for. You know, computing that becomes part of your life that is no different from, say, breathing or waking up or going to bed. Now, some other definitions that you may have heard of, and I'm not going to cover most of them. You, as you can read the slide, and you'll see that I've given answers to many of these definitions, at least short blurbs. The more interesting ones, I would say, are wireless computing, which is basically anything that doesn't have a wire, which means that you have freedom of movement. Then you have wearable computing, which is anything that you can put on your body and carry around. You also have client-server computing, or thin client computing, where basically you have a server or something in the cloud, and you're getting service from it. This is actually a very powerful paradigm that is actually allowing mobile phones to do very powerful services by using the capabilities existing in the cloud, things like what Project Hawaii is providing or other services. We also have other more exotic terms like sentient computing, where we use or context-aware computing, where you use the sensors to understand what is going on and then provide cool, context-aware services to people. An example of this is Google Maps or Bing Maps, where your location automatically is found, and then the map automatically zooms into where you are without you having to type anything. That's an example of context- or location-aware computing. We also have ambient and palpable computing, which is computing that is basically in the background or foreground of what you're doing. And finally, we have things like disappearing computing, which is actually one of the key things that people want from computers. Disappearing computing is computing that exists without you even being aware of it. There are a few classical examples of this in the world today, examples being the cellular network and Wi-Fi networks. 
It just works. You have no idea how it works or where the base stations are. It just works. You, have, you need no effort at all to even use it. It just works. This is actually what many people are striving for with computing systems. Systems that just work without you needing to understand anything. Now, let's take a step back and take a, a little walk through history of computing. This is what computing looks like in the early 80s. It was actually driven by, what, by these kind of systems known as large mainframes. These were gigantic machines that cost millions of dollars, and they're hosted in one central location. And all the people who wanted to use it, seen on the far right, had to log in using a very simple terminal device, connected using a network, or usually located where the mainframe itself was sitting. And then they had access to the mainframe. And everything was running on these machines. There was no computation being done on those devices that the people were using. They were mostly displays. Now, this was how it was done back in the 80s. In the early 90s, or the late 1980s, with the introduction of personal computers, like the PCXT from IBM and the Apple II from Apple, people started having their own personal computers. And then nobody wanted to use a mainframe anymore. Because one of the problems with mainframes is you had to share with other people. If you needed to run something, you might have to wait days or even weeks because there were people in front of you. With your own computer, it was just yours. You could do whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted to do it. And this was great, but there's one thing missing. And as you'll see, that was the big revolution that happened in the middle of the 1990s that exists until today. There was a huge technological leap forward that was made possible by something called the internet. All of a sudden, these computers were connected to each other. And that made the world much closer than it actually is. Because now people in China could talk to people in India, to talk to people in Singapore, talk to people in the US, and the world became much smaller. Every computer was now much more powerful than it used to be simply because it had access to resources from around the world. And the internet is fundamentally the game changer that has caused the internet, that has caused the computing revolution that we see today. Now, what about the future? What about looking, say, five, 10 years down the road? Where do we think computing is gonna go? Well, the future is mobile, mobile and pervasive. We are already seeing happening, and it's going to happen in much more powerful ways moving forward. Basically, you're going to have one or two devices, most likely your cell phone, or maybe a tablet, or something like that, that's going to control all your devices around you. And it's going to pull all kinds of services from clouds, from nearby computers, from other people around the world. You know, these could involve things like group chat, video streaming, push to talk. Gaming, you know, optical character recognition, speech translation, language translation, and everything's going to be cloud-based. Cloud-based and social. And that is where the world is going to go to. It is already happening. It's just a matter of time. Now, given this, what is a fundamental problem with making this happen? Well, we take a step back and we look at what a very visionary person called Mark Weiser, who actually coined the term ubiquitous computing, described back in the early 1990s. You should take some time to read this quote, and you'll see that what he actually said is that using computers is really frustrating because most systems make you do what the computer wants to do. You can't do what you want to do. Whereas as humans, we are already able to process huge amounts of information, like when we walk through the woods. But we find that really enjoyable, whereas everybody struggles to use a new piece of software. So how do we get over the fact that computers are really hard to use, whereas more complicated tasks that we do daily are actually easy to do. So how can we make the computing tasks as easy to do as the really complicated things we already do daily, like playing soccer or going for a walk or driving a car? We find those easy and fun to do, yet we do not find using a computer fun to use in many cases. Well, that comes down to the requirements for making ubiquitous or pervasive computing work. It turns out that there's actually three, reasons, there's three components that need to be in place before these things can become a reality. The three parts are, first you need cheap, low power computers with really good displays that are good enough for people to get stuff done. And with enough inputs like keyboards or touch screens or something that we can actually interact with it. Next, we need network connectivity because as the internet has shown, nobody really wants to be disconnected anymore. You want to be able to talk to your friends. You want to be able to pull cloud services. You want to be able to see what's going on on the other side of the world. And finally, we need software that makes it all possible. Now, let's look at each of these three things in turn and see where we are. First, cheap, low-power computers. 
we actually have lots of examples of these devices already. For example, on the bottom right hand side, we see a portable chess player on running on a small phone. We have watches that run Linux or Windows or other high powered operating systems. We have cell phones that are really powerful devices. Today's cell phone is more powerful than some of the computers that were used 20 years ago, possibly even some of the mainframes. It's amazing where the technology has come in just 20 years. Then we have all sorts of specialized sensor devices. And finally, we even have leisure devices that are actually really powerful computers. Things like Sony's Ibo, which was a personal robot for children. So in terms of devices, we have devices that have screens that have input modalities. Things like the iPhone, things like and the latest Android phones, things like the latest Phone 7 phones. We have those. Now, do we have the network? Turns out we do. Now, on this side, we show the traditional wired connectivity that ranges from things in the past like ATM, all the way up to 10 gig E and optical networks, which are showing up these days. But nobody wants to really plug in a cable anymore. So what about the wireless space? Turns out the wireless space, we have an abundance of protocols and network uh, connectivity. We have all the wireless standards, which include Bluetooth, infrared, and the numerous Wi-Fi standards. We have many cellular standards, like EVDO, WiMAX, LTE, 4G, all these things are coming out. So in terms of connectivity, we are there as well. And in terms of, and not just cellular connectivity, also a sensor connectivity. Things like RFID, NFC, and these are showing up in many situations now, especially in transportation, where many companies actually use NFC or RFID to issue tickets. Now what about software? Unfortunately, this is where we hit a brick wall. We don't actually have the software. We have some cases of software, but nothing that really ties everything together into a coherent story. I mean, we have good examples like iOS, Android, Phone 7 that do a good attempt, but they're nowhere good enough for what we want to do in our general life. The phone still makes us scream at times, and we don't want that. But some of you might be saying, you know, there's this law we keep hearing about called Moore's Law that basically says all problems go away if you wait long enough. So what about that? Well, I have a graph that I created that goes up to 2006 on the bottom right-hand corner that shows the technological improvements for five things critical to cell phones. The top, four, the top three lines show the disk, CPU, and available RAM, and they follow what is known as exponential improvement, which means everything doubles about every 12 to 18 months. The fourth line here shows wireless technology, and that seems to double about every two years. The last line at the bottom shows battery power. And unfortunately, this is not doubling. This has a slow linear increase. So in, even in the near future, battery will always be a fundamental problem. And this is never going to go away. Right? So because of that, we have limitations for what we can do on the phone, which is another reason why cloud services are becoming so popular. But there is one big glaring exception. And this is the fundamental reason why creating pervasive and ubiquitous computing applications is so hard. There is one resource that has been constant for all of time. You can go from the Ice Age to today, and this thing is still the same. In fact, it might have gone lower. Any guesses? Well, this is human attention. The ability of humans to process and understand large amounts of information. It has remained constant from the dawn of time, or whenever humans started walking this earth. And this is particularly bad, because in today's world, we are getting far more information than our parents used to, and especially our grandparents. We are being asked to process so many different input streams. For example, your parents might have only read one newspaper. It's not uncommon for us to be reading 10 or 20 today, daily. How do you handle all that information? We just can't do it, because our processing capability has not kept up. The huge amounts of information are now available at our fingertips. And this is why there is a big problem with the systems that are out there. Now, what can we do about it? Well, let's look at some things you might want to agree or disagree about. Hardware challenges have all been solved. You know, it's all about software. To a large extent, this is true, but not completely. There are still a lot of hardware challenges related to battery and display and inputs. But by and large, most of the problems that people face with their cell phones today are not related to hardware. It is due to software, right? And this is a great opportunity for you because software is doesn't require specialized uh, manufacturing plants or specialized knowledge. Software requires an idea. It requires a vision. 
And if you have it, you can go build it. Which leads to the next problem. Software is easy, the problem is the hardware. Unfortunately, this is not true at all. So software is not easy. Making something that even your grandmother could use is really, really hard. And unfortunately, now that phones are being used by everyone, anything you build really does have to be used by an age group from 8 to 80. It is no longer true that you can just target undergraduates or professionals. You really do have to target the entire population. Another perception is that pervasive computing is just a fad. It will go away. This is not true at all. Pervasive computing is here to stay. If anything, it's going to become far more powerful. You will see in a few years, your homes will start being connected to other homes. Your t your it is not uncommon for TVs already to have chips in them that talk to back-end servers. We all now have personal video recorders in many places that are able to customize our preferences. And all these things will just become, will just increasingly become more common. Pervasive computing is definitely here to stay. There will be even more devices in the environment. And we need a way to figure it out. And finally, one common myth is that all the cool ideas have been done already. This is absolutely wrong. There are many cool ideas out there. They just need to be done. This is a great opportunity. What I've covered so far shows that you know pervasive computing is here to stay. But unfortunately, the main limitation is a lack of software that actually helps people do interesting things in ways they want to do it. Fortunately, this is also a great opportunity for all the entrepreneurs out there. If you can think of a great idea that you know, solves a problem that you and your friends have, it's quite likely this will also solve a problem that other people have. So you should really think about doing something and releasing it and getting a user base. And don't believe that your idea, just because it's simple, doesn't mean it isn't cool. The best ideas are always simple. Because simple ideas make a big difference. And with that, I'd like to end this first part of the lecture. And I'll see you later for the next in the series of lectures. Thank you.